morning. I am Zach Ellsworth, and welcome to this Stalls TV presentation. Thanks for joining me here live this morning in the Think Tank studio here at Stalls TV. Today's class is called Setting Up Shop. It is tips for planning and organizing your t-shirt business. And if you're not in the t-shirt business just yet, hopefully some of the tips, especially in the second half, actually in both halves of our presentation today, should um, hopefully help you out in what you need to think about to set up your business. So why specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, would somebody choose the t-shirt business? We're going to launch a poll to you here in just a second, but um, there's a lot of different reasons that people choose to get into business for themselves anyway. The, the number one reported reason that people start their own business is for freedom. And it's freedom to do a bunch of different things, whether it's being creative, making your own decisions, uh, really financial freedom. Uh, if you don't have that in your current workplace, there's a lot of reasons that people start a business, but freedom for from something or for something is the number one reason that, that small businesses get started in the United States. Now, one poll that we don't have uh, for you today that we've run in previous classes is how large is your business? Like how many employees do you have? So hopefully this class today is going to speak to you whether you're running the business by yourself, whether you have uh, a few employees or maybe even just under 10. If you have more than that, there will be some principles that you can certainly uh, take out of this. But this class will probably benefit those of you most who are 10 employees or less, uh, specifically kind of just starting out. So you're gonna learn uh, a little bit about some tools to help run the business. We're also gonna talk a little bit about sales structure. We're gonna talk about sales, production, administration in the second half of the class, but in the first half, we're gonna talk about the bigger picture planning stuff, especially if you're just getting started or if you're reorganizing your business. There are some things that we can talk about and think about that'll set us off in the right direction. So one of the most important parts of our live presentations is the feedback, the live feedback that we get from you. So you can see in the bottom right hand corner of your GoToWebinar client, there is a chat or a question window. You can feel free to chat questions into that window. We will uh, stop, pause, and take some time to answer those questions as our class goes on. I do have Karen helping me out running the camera as well as feeding the questions in. So as you have questions on any of the points, where we go along, please feel free to chat those in and we will do our best to answer those here while we are live on air. I will also leave uh, a few minutes at the end of our session for Q&A. So if you want to hold them to the end, that's fine too, but we will catch up to the questions. Okay, so the question is, why choose the t-shirt business specifically? And we're going to launch a poll and just kind of see why you chose or are thinking about choosing the t-shirt business as the small business that you're going to run. So we gave you four different options. Why did you choose the t-shirt business? One, because it seemed like the most fun. Two, because it seemed like the most profitable. Three, because it seemed like the most creative. Or four, because it seemed like the easiest to get started. So maybe it's a combination of those, but we're asking you to choose one of those here this morning. And we'll give you just a few more seconds to answer that. And then Karen's going to report to us the results of that poll. All right, Karen, what do we have for our results? 12% said that it seemed like the most fun. Okay, so t-shirt business isn't the most fun then is what we're saying. <laughs> All right. 23% said it seemed like the most profitable. Okay. 46% said it seemed like the most creative. Mm -hmm. And 19% seemed like the easiest to get started. <clears throat> All right, awesome. Um, I would probably say... Uh, based on what I was guessing ahead of time. Those, those numbers kind of shook out the way that I expected them to. So most of you chose the t-shirt business, and it could be, like we said, a combination of these reasons, but your number one reason for choosing the t-shirt business was because it seemed like the most creative. So we have a lot of creative folks uh, watching us this morning, interacting with us. Feel free to ask your creative questions and we'll get those answered for you. So appreciate you answering that question. Only 23% of you thought it was the most profitable, 19% thought it was the easiest to get started, and 12% thought it seemed like the most fun. So we'll see if we can mix business and fun as we go through our class here for those 12% of you that are having fun doing the t-shirts. I'm sure more of you are, uh, but not your number one priority. All right, so we're going to get started with some keys 
to planning and organizing your business. And when planning any business or when starting any endeavor, it's important to have your end result in mind. So when we have our end result in mind, and this is whether you're giving a sales pitch, there's actually, uh, if you ever have taken a Dale Carnegie sales course, at the end of it, one of the final closing methods that they give you is to paint a picture for the person that you're selling to about what ultimately will happen if they choose to invest in your product or your service. And when we're starting our own business, we are visualizing the end goal. Do we want the financial freedom that comes with owning three storefronts and having employing 30 to 50 people? Uh, or maybe our end goal is just to help out friends and family along the way. Having that end goal in mind will help us to answer all of the questions that we're going to be asking. And it's not to say that that end goal can't change as your business grows and morphs and as you learn lessons uh, from opening up a business. But you definitely would need to have an end result in mind because if you can't see the finish line, it's very difficult to run the race. So there are some key decisions that we have to make when we're planning or organizing our business. And this can be a reorganizational question if you've already been in business for a while, but if you're just getting started, there are some key questions that we can ask on the front end. The number one question that I think we should ask when we're planning and organizing our t-shirt business is, who are my customers? As a t-shirt business, who are my customers? And give some thought to it. Don't answer all of these questions right away. I do encourage you to write them down. We can provide after the class the outline of the questions uh, that you should be asking to where you can think about them. But give some thought to these questions. So who are my customers? And we're going to kind of repeat this as we go on. But if you don't know who your ideal customer is, and we also have Stalls TV classes about who your ideal customer is. There was a customer acquisition class, um, five key strategies to customer acquisition, I believe was what it was called. You can find that in the Stalls TV archives. That'll help you with some additional questions under that. But who are your customers? Are they schools? Is it your friends and family? Is it folks from the West Coast, folks from the East Coast? Maybe it's folks down South. Maybe it's a, an organization. Maybe it's a sports team. Um, but answer the question, who are your customers? And then also start to prioritize them. Like this is the number one customer that I want because you'll find as you grow your business that you won't be able to successfully serve everybody all the time because it, it just doesn't make sense. It's a principle that's proven throughout business and throughout history. You can't make everyone happy all the time. So choose the customers that you want to do business with ahead of time. So who are your customers? And maybe you're starting the flip side like a lot of businesses do and people, you decorated a few shirts for friends or family and people started coming to you to say, oh, I would like those too. So your customers are coming to you. But take a minute to say, if they weren't coming to me, who would I go after? Who are my customers? Who am I best suited to serve? So that's question number one on planning and organizing the business. Define who your customers are. Second most important question, and you can't answer it until you answer the first one of who are my customers. The second question is, what problem am I solving for them? Or another way to say that, why would they want to buy from me? What solution am I selling to them? What is the compelling reason that my customer would want to invest or make a purchase from my t-shirt company? I'll just give you a few examples of reasons that people would want to purchase from you. If you're selling regionally um, and there's somebody who's an incumbent in the business or the customers that you're going after, maybe you offer a greater level of convenience than they can currently find. Maybe your uh, goal will be to hold the customer's hand a little better through the personalization process. There's a company um, that was featured in Inc. Magazine, uh, which you can find it at Inc.com. It's called Rebel Athletic. They were featured in that magazine and they are a challenger brand to varsity brands. They service the cheer and the dance markets. So varsity is one of these, uh, they run a lot of competitions, they service a lot of customers. They're the clear number one in the cheer market. Well, Rebel Athletic said, we can do some things better than varsity and target a specific customer. So their uniforms are more expensive, but they do a much better job of hand-holding through the design process. They actually employ fashion designers that you can get a consultation with. You're going to pay more for it. However, it's 
the approach that they're taking. If you're willing to pay more and uh, you want your hand held through the design process to create something completely unique, they give you that option. So that's, that's another example. So you could be more convenient. You could do a better job of hand holding. You could be more inexpensive. And this is a model that quite a few businesses have taken. I, I personally think that the inexpensive model is a difficult one to sustain because eventually people will figure out ways to be less expensive than you. The next person can come up and if all you're fighting on is your price or how inexpensive you are, it'll eat away at the profit that will keep your business going. So I think that's a tough one, but it's something um, that you can offer as an option. Maybe the problem that you're solving is delivery times. Maybe in your area, uh, people are delivering in seven to 10 days and you have the ability to deliver in three to five. So maybe it's quick delivery. Again, defining your customer first, understanding who they are, and then starting to answer these questions about what problem will you solve for that particular set of customers will help. Maybe also, instead of quick delivery, maybe you're providing them options that they can't find anywhere else. Maybe you're the only one who can do this particular service or achieve this particular look. And you're always on the cutting edge of what's happening next. So all of those are problems that you can solve uh, for your customers or reasons that that particular customer may want to buy from you. Third question that we have to answer when we're planning, organizing, or reorganizing the business. So who are my customers? What problem am I solving? Or why would they want to buy from me rather than the next person? Three, we have to answer the question, how do I reach them? Now, there's a number of ways to do this, and you have to figure out which one is the best for your business. But again, I'm going to encourage you to think about this in, in the realm of making sure you have in perspective where you want to be 5, 10, 20 years down the road with your business. So how do you reach them? Well, there's a few different ways. One, the initial way you think about reaching a customer uh, would be advertising. So when you think of advertising, what do you think of? Traditionally, or 15, 20 years ago, when you thought of advertising, you thought of maybe local newspapers, trade publications, billboards, these different print methods that were available to reach someone. Today, when you think of advertising, a lot of the hot classes that we feature here on Stalls TV or the ones that receive the most interaction and feedback are the classes that teach us how to reach people online, whether that's through a social network, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it. Um, or whether it's through our own website and utilizing some type of online advertising like Google AdWords. So how do you reach your customer with the message that is unique to you? Because if you're just going out and saying, we decorate shirts, and there's five other people that say you decorate shirts, that's probably not the type of advertising that you want to do. So you really need to find out, figure out what that unique thing is that you're doing that's different, advertise it, to those customers that you want to reach and give them a reason to want to come by from you. So when you're advertising, think about that. One other great way to advertise, and this one uh, in my personal opinion is underutilized, and that's even by myself in kind of advertising what we do here at Stalls, is referral business. So get your customers to do the advertising for you. And once you understand who they are, you can understand how to incentivize them to do that, to do the advertising for you as well. So we can reach people through advertising or marketing, we would call that. We can reach people through a sales team, which we're going to come back to sales team in a little bit to talk about how you might structure that. Um, so I won't go deep into that one right now. But your sales team could be family, it could be friends, it can be employees, it can be customers. You could also reach people through a retail location. Now, a lot of us, when we think t-shirt shop, maybe we immediately go to somebody's printing in their garage. Maybe we immediately think the sporting goods shop on the corner that has a retail storefront. One of the less expensive ways, and we're going to kind of get into this in uh, just a second, how do we get to market as less expensive or with the least amount of investment as possible, with the least amount of waste as possible, consider a pop-up shop to test that retail concept. So instead of investing in an 18-month or 36-month lease for a building that you have to commit to, try doing a pop-up shop. Partner with somebody who already has a space that may sell something else and set up your decorating facility in there to try and sell for a weekend or a couple weeks. It's a, it's a less expensive way to test whether a retail location is really going to draw 
your customers in. And it'll also teach you a lot of lessons along the way as to how to merchandise your product and what people ask for or are looking for when they come in. If you haven't had the opportunity to be face to face with your customers, it's a, it's a great way to do that. So how do we reach them? Advertising, sales team, retail location. Um, another way to advertise, you can also do mailers or send out samples. And this is a technique that has proven effective for a lot of the folks that we talk to here at Stalls when they send mailers out or packets showing the service that they offer and how they're going to save their target customers money by doing business with them. So we've said, who are my customers? We've said, what problem am I solving for them? Or why would they want to buy from me? We've talked about needing to answer the question, what's the best way or how do I reach them? Probably one of the most important questions that we have to ask besides defining customers when we're planning or organizing our t-shirt business is how exactly are we going to make money? So this is a question that I don't think, um, if I had to guess, I would say we probably don't spend enough time figuring out the different ways that we can make money with our t-shirt business or any business from that matter. And the fact is, this should probably be one of those first questions that, that we consider. How are we going to make money to sustain the business? So as a subset of questions to that, how do I make money? Obviously, you're going to think, well, I'm going to sell t-shirts. But how much are we going to sell them for? What types of decoration are we going to offer? How much time does that consume of mine if I'm a one-person shop to do that type of decoration? So we really need to think through. Um, how we make money from selling a t-shirt. A couple ways to do that. One, how much do you need to make? And again, different for every business probably that is uh, logged into our broadcast today. But if you're doing it as a hobby, you obviously don't need to make as much as if you're doing it for a full-time job. And there's probably a lot of spaces in between where it's a little bit extra income. Maybe a significant other has a full-time job and you're just doing this for extra income. All of those questions, answers to those questions, are going to dictate our approach to how much we invest in our advertising, how much we invest into acquiring those customers that we've defined. And also, we can start thinking about which customers do we think are going to be the most profitable? Who spends the most on decorated apparel at the highest margin or the highest price? Who can we sell high-priced items to? If you only want to decorate 100 items a month, but you want to make the same that a guy who decorates 500 screen printing wise does, there's some moves that we can make uh, to get to that point. So how much money do you need to make? You need to define before you can say, how do I make that money? Um, another example, actually two examples that, that I want to use. A lot of people look at, use Henry Ford in business books as an example of, oh, he created the assembly line and he sold all of these cars. He knocked a lot of cost out of the system. But the interesting thing, um, when he was interviewed about all of these things back when he was developing this line, what happened was he focused on the end result. To go back to our original point, Henry Ford was focusing on the end result, and he reverse engineered the process, knowing that what he needed to sell. So he didn't say, how do I? Um, he didn't say, how do I, here's the expense involved with production line assembly. Let's just say it cost him $100 to make a car. He didn't say, well, it cost me $100, so I should charge $500. What Henry Ford did was he said, I can sell 1 million cars if I can get the price down to $500. And then he reverse engineered the production process from there to say, I need to get it to here. So it was the market that defined the production capability uh, for Henry Ford. And that can define us as well. If we say, I know I can sell a million t-shirts if I can sell them for whatever the amount of money is, $9, $12, $15, depending on what your decoration method is. If I know I can do that, then you reverse engineer back to your equipment investments and what it's actually going to take to get um, to that number of shirts sold. Second thing, when thinking about how to make money, there is an exercise that is put on by a company called Strategizer. Um, and you can look this up online. I'm not, um, I won't be able to show it to you here today. I'm going to show you a few other things here in a few minutes. But 
if you look up strategizer.com, they help you build a business model. They give you a business model exercise. There's a few YouTube videos from them that kind of walk you through their process for building um, a particular business model. And what I found in, the, in going through the exercise and reading more about it, the most interesting question to me that they have you ask is you define your customers, you define what it is you're selling to them originally, what your, um, what your unique selling proposition is. And then you say, what if I gave that away? What if I gave away my core product to those customers, meaning sold that at zero dollars? What are other ways that the business can continue to maintain itself? Now, right off the bat, you might think, well, there's no way for that to happen. But if you start thinking, I think that you'll find some ways. For example, they give an example of a restaurant business. Their core product in the restaurant business is to sell food to a customer. You go in, you look at a menu, you place an order, you're paying for the food. What if you went into a restaurant and you just paid for how long you sat at the table? And you can get, you're giving the food away for free and you're charging for the table or you're charging for the preparation of the food and not necessarily the food itself or whatever. They give a few different examples there, but things to think about. So if you gave away t-shirts, what could you actually charge for to where the business can continue to generate a profit and make more money? Not that you would give away those t-shirts because we definitely want you to be selling shirts, but it's just something to think about to add revenue streams to the business to where you can sustain yourself uh, as you grow. Should competitors come in and start to make you have to drop your t-shirt prices, you can still be making money in other ways around your core product, but not just selling it directly. So things to think about there. So how do you make money in the business? So who are my customers? What problems am I solving? How do I reach them? How do I make money? Fifth question, probably the most important one for a growing business or somebody that's already started, how do I test all of those assumptions? Because everything we just did, all of the exercise we just went through as you go through and you start to answer those four questions, they're all assumptions. It's what we think that we know. And this is where a book um, that I read recently, it's been out for probably 10 years, and actually I'll ask Karen to um, click to my computer screen here. We'll just give you a quick look at their website. But there's a book, it's called The Lean Startup. And it says there on your screen, the movement that is transforming how new products are built and launched. Uh, and it looks like we're having a, just a bit of technical difficulty, so you won't see it there. But basically, it's a book called The Lean Startup. It's by a guy named Eric, um, Eric Reese. It's Eric, R-I-E-S. And what he does, he goes through, obviously, I would recommend picking up the book, whether it's on Kindle or um, whatever, especially if you're in the beginning stages of starting your business, even if you're a little bit bigger. But what he does is he gives you a way to test assumptions. And he asserts that the quicker that you can test an assumption and the um, less expensive that it is, the less waste will be in the process. And really, his, his key example from his experience is he started a business, he spent six months in the technology world on developing a particular product. And then it went to market and it failed. And he had already invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into the product, goes to market, customers don't want it. So what he did is he went back and started offering, um, he started going to market quicker with his ideas and taking cost out of the process, basically launching with what he calls a minimum viable product, like what will the market accept at an absolute minimum to where we can start testing our assumptions if our customers are really interested uh, in what we're going to be selling. Basically, he teaches that a company in its first three years of business is basically the viability stage to say, is this business a good business to keep growing? If you've ever watched the television show Shark Tank, you've probably heard that from the sharks as well. If a business is less than three years old, they basically give it to that three-year mark to become profitable. If after three years you're not profitable, you're doing something wrong or your customers don't want uh, what it is that you have. The business just isn't built to succeed. So it's time to start over, reorganize, do those types of things. Um, so you're in the viability stage for those first three years. In those first three years, you want to plan, test, and learn as quickly as possible. You want to learn, plan about who your customers are, test to make sure you know who they are, and learn 
uh, from that experience? Are there expenses or waste that we can take out of the product? Is there waste that we can take out of our advertising budget? Is there waste that we can take out of our sales team, whatever that is? So lots of ways um, to slice and dice and lots of things to think about. But I would highly recommend picking up that book. I don't know if our, um, did our technical thing resolve itself? Yes. All right. So we have it there. So the Lean Startup, highly recommend picking up that book. Um, we also need to think about what are your assumptions. And that's really everything that we talked about in those first four questions. All right. Go ahead, Karen, if you can bring us back. Um, so I'll open it up just for a minute or two. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to type those in at this point before we kind of get into the second half of the presentation with the 15, 20 minutes that we have left, which is day-to-day -day operations. Any questions come in at all, Karen? No? All right, great. OK, so that was keys to planning and organizing kind of before launch. And we kind of got to the launch phase that says we really need to test those assumptions as quickly and as inexpensively as possible, reducing the amount of waste that we have in our planning process as well as in our production processes. So next, we want to talk about day-to-day -day operations. And again, going to look different depending on what your ultimate goals are. And we want to keep sight of our ultimate goal that we were defining for our business, whether that's multiple storefronts and this many employees, whether it's maximizing with this many customers, or whatever your ultimate goal is, whether it's $5 million in sales, $1 million in sales, maybe it's $100,000 in sales that, that your ultimate goal is. Don't lose sight of your ultimate goal and get lost in these day-to-day -day operations. So we're going to break this into three sections, our day-to-day -day operations. And we'll, we'll move through them probably fairly quickly, but feel free to chat in those questions. We're going to talk about sales. We're going to talk about production. And we're going to talk about what I call the fun stuff, which is said very sarcastically, because it's all administrative work that comes along with all of the fun stuff of sales and production, all of the stuff that you have to take care of to support the sales, production, and growth of your business. So sales. When we talk about sales, we can structure sales a number of different ways. Odds are, I'm guessing that most of the folks who are watching us today are a three employee or less company. So there's not much sales structure to be done. You're probably the primary salesperson. So the sales could be you. It could be an employee that you hire and bring on the books onto your payroll. It could be contract labor. Your sales team can also be your customers. Um, so if your sales team is you, these are kind of the tips that um, I would encourage you to consider. If your sales team is you and you want to expand the business at all from where you're at, because you're going to start to get consumed with planning how to grow the next step, you're going to get consumed, especially if you're a one-person shop, with how do I sell? How do I do production? How do I do these next steps? So what you want to do to expand is build systems and processes. Basically, the goal is to duplicate yourself in whatever role you're playing as an entrepreneur. And that's the problem that um, actually most people have as they begin to grow their companies. It's finding ways to duplicate yourself. I read, um, I think it was in a magazine. I think it was in Inc. Magazine again. People who have problems delegating, they say that if you can trust somebody to do the job as 80% of what you would do it, then delegate it to them. And that gives you time to free up to do those things where you don't have someone that can do the job to 80% of your ability. Is it going to be up totally to par with what you think uh, it should be based on if you were doing it? Probably not. And we have to learn as entrepreneurs to accept that if we're going to grow our company. So rule of thumb. If somebody can do the job 80% as good as you, delegate that job to them if you have access to those folks. You want to duplicate yourself. One of the ways that you can do that in the sales organization is by choosing customers that have sales built into it. So rather than going out and meeting with all of these individual leagues or all these individual teams that, that you may talk to or organizations, build a sales organization that's built on fundraisers or that's built in a direct sales model. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Avon or the Tupperware, or probably as decorators, you're familiar with 31 Gifts. They have built direct sales models to where the folks who started the business are not the ones out selling. They're setting up other salespeople to do the selling and set up other salespeople. So 
the network keeps growing and growing and the business keeps growing just by duplicating yourself and them duplicating themselves. So something to consider. I'm not saying all of you guys should go out and start a direct sales channel, but has anybody tried doing, uh, especially when we talk about a, a pop-up shop or something like that, giving people the ability to do that pop-up shop for you and uh, work as a sales team. Secondly, you could hire an employee um, to do sales. The way to structure that, um, the most inexpensive way to structure that is to set them up on commission only, but that's a very high risk for a salesperson that will be dedicated to representing you. If you're going to set them up on commission only, odds are they're probably going to represent other products or other brands as well, unless you have an extraordinarily unique selling proposition to the market and a very large base of customers. So what's probably going to have to happen is find a person that believes in your mission. If you cast vision for the company and you have a mission that they can be on with you, people are willing to work for a little bit less to feel more part of the growth of a company at the ground floor. So you can bring them on as an employee with a base and a modest commission for what they sell. Um, now, normally what happens when you're looking at your books, most people probably don't want sales and marketing to be more than 10 to 15 percent of the sales and marketing expense to be more than 10 to 15 percent of the gross revenue that you're going to generate. Uh, if you are going to generate, let's just say, $250,000 in sales, you're going to want to be between $25,000 to $50,000 in sales and marketing expense to generate those sales based on the profit margins that exist in our industry. Maybe you're receiving exceptional profit margins, uh, maybe not, but those are some rules of thumb uh, to think about. So an employee, you can find, we've done classes here on millennials as well, and the research shows that Millennials want to be part of something that's growing. They want to see advancement. They want to be part. They want to contribute. Most people do. Um, that's not necessarily a surprise, but more so in the millennial generation, those who are currently 20 to 34 years old, the folks that are entering the workforce and looking for growth, they want to help a company grow and be part of that growth. You could also do contract labor for sales, and that's just setting up somebody as a contractor. You can do that for uh, your production as well. The only thing, and again, this is all check with your accountant, and we'll talk about accountants here uh, in just a minute, but you'll want to get advice from a financial or an accounting professional on the best way to structure that for your particular business. But you can do you. If it's you, work diligently to replace yourself and duplicate yourself everywhere possible in a sales structure. Uh, you could do a full-time employee with base plus commission or commission only. And you can do contract labor as well for commission only. Secondly, outside of sales, we can talk about production. So three key ways in the decorating industry to do production. All in-house, all contract, or a mix of the two. So most people contract out the work that they don't have the capability to do. Obviously, if you're contracting it out, nine times out of ten, you're going to make less money on those jobs, but you also don't have to worry about the production flow uh, for those garments coming in or transfers or whichever uh, decorating method that you're using. Most folks in our industry, most folks who uh, are Stahl's customers are using a mix of both in-house and contract production. Not everybody has the capacity and embroidery heads. Maybe you have all of the decorating technologies under one roof, but at certain times of the year when your big orders come in, you might not have the capacity to handle it. So you contract out some of that work that you can trust other contractors to do for you. So with production in-house, there's a couple additional things that you have to worry about, and I'm sure a lot of you have already worried about them in the past. First, you have to worry about receiving your items for a particular order. Most of us are not inventorying the um, garments that we're selling, most of us, I say. Uh, some of us in a retail shop may do a little bit of that, but you still have to do the receiving part of garments. Did I get what I ordered from my blank garment supplier? You have to receive in your transfers or whatever your decorating method is. You have to receive in your CAD cut rolls of material uh, to load in your cutter and make sure everything matches up in time, the turn times. When is the best time to match up your cut graphics or your transfers to your shirts? Do you do it when it's received in if you have it ready? Do you do it at the heat press? All things 
that you really need to think through the process with the goal of eliminating waste. So if I have to cut my graphics before the shirt comes in and I handle them when I'm cutting them, and then I have to store them somewhere, and then I have to pull them back out of storage, and then I have to match them up with the garments, is there a step in there that I can cut out to eliminate a little bit of waste in that process? Do I wait till I know the shirts are coming in to cut my graphics? Or do I wait to open my transfer box until the garments get there, or vice versa? All questions that you need to answer, but really work towards eliminating waste in that production system, and it'll give you more time to do the sales part that's going to keep the business uh, going. Now, as far as administration goes, the fun stuff. So sales and production, we would consider revenue generating activities. When you're producing shirts, you're making money for the company. When you're selling shirts, you're making money for the company. Um, one of the things that isn't um, very visibly or very obviously revenue generating is administrative work. So there's a couple different ways to handle administrative work, and I'm going to guess that you're going to take, I would probably recommend that you take a mix uh, of, these, of these things that we're going to show you. So one, you can do all of your administrative work with local professionals. Um, there is some administrative work that you're going to have to take care of with processing orders and those types of things, but you have to, you, I would recommend looking for a, an accountant, whether that's local um, or online, a bank, that you can trust to do business with, and also an attorney. And that's kind of to, to take care of all of these administrative things that you're going to get into. One of the most surprising things in starting your own business, at least for a lot of people, is finding out how much work there is that's not actually what you thought the business was in selling shirts and producing them, uh, especially when it comes to accounting and sales tax and um, how do I pay my employees, how do I deal with payroll, how do I incorporate my business, all of these different types of things that you have to worry about, filing your taxes at the end of the year. Um, not unimportant things, just not revenue generating things, things that will take your attention from the revenue generating. So I wanted to give you, um, kind of as we close up, a few online options for taking care of some of those things. And I'm going to ask Karen to switch back to my computer here. So online options for running your business. One. Uh, probably the most popular one and has gotten the most press coverage over recent years is Square Up. And you can visit squareup.com. There we go, we got the site here. You can visit squareup.com. And what they do, most people know Square Up as the payment kiosk that you can swipe um, on your cell phone. But what Square does is a lot more than just those payment kiosks. So that is one of the options. Uh, we're going to scroll down the page. So it helps you with the payment kiosk, whether that is a point of sale kiosk or just a little swipe card that runs through your phone. You can also download their app and process payments there. And I'm going to invite you to compare the uh, rates that these folks give you to your local bank for payment processing and some of the other things that we're going to take a look at. But it's a payment kiosk. It's an app. Square also recently uh, launched doing payroll. So if you're thinking about adding employees, Square is an option for you to pay your employees. They also do marketing and loyalty programs as well. So you can manage your people, you can manage places, and you can manage payroll. They do marketing follow-up, they'll do email blasts for you, those types of things. And Square also launched, um, not too long ago, a capitalization program. So if you need a loan, to invest in equipment or invest in whatever it is that you need, Square will offer you capital based on the amount of sales that you're putting through their particular system. So Square is one thing that can make your life as an entrepreneur a little bit easier. But the next one we're going to look at is Zero, and that is X E R O Zero.com. And what Zero is is an accounting system that um, competes with QuickBooks. Um, so most of you have heard of QuickBooks. It's a ubiquitous accounting system that really focuses on the local accountants in your area. So if you're going to find a local accountant, odds are they're going to recommend you get set up with QuickBooks because they already are. But if you want to manage your own accounting, you can use um, this Zero system. And on their website, they talk about popular features 
that will change your life. So zero gives you the ability to do invoicing in quotes, gives you the ability to do bank reconciliation. There are 500 plus third party apps that deal with inventory, time tracking, expenses that all integrate. It'll take care of purchase orders for you. Um, they actually also advertise um, on the website that you can, if you're already in QuickBooks, they can convert you. You can also do payroll in Zero, and I would encourage you to, to kind of check out this website um, because the payroll is, is rolling out for different states. So depending on the state you're in, uh, will determine if you can use Zero for your payroll. All right. So QuickBooks as well, we talked about. So Square and Zero are really, if I need to send invoices, if I need to do accounting, I can do those types of things from there. The other part of the business that gets difficult is managing customer relationships and keeping everything on the same page to know what all is happening in your day. And I'm going to recommend two sites for you to look at. Um, both, both operate as applications on your smartphones as well. One is called 17 Hats. And it's the number one, the number seven, and the word hats, H-A-T-S, dot com. So 17hats.com. And it is actually built specifically for the entrepreneur who is a business of one. So they say they created the software specifically for businesses of one with a focus on simplicity and ease of use. And this one, this particular uh, software is going to work as a customer relationship manager as well. So it's going to keep your customer information. You can set up your calendar. You can set up your to-do list. You can send emails. You can send invoices. And everything kind of gets pulled together into one place. You can also, on 17 Hats, do accounting as well. It's not as robust on the accounting side as QuickBooks or Zero would be. But if you need very simple accounting practices, 17 Hats gives you the ability to do that as well. And the last one, which um, is more of a personal assistant on your phone, is called Close, C-L-O-Z-E dot com. So if you go to close.com, what their software does is actually syncs with your phone and gets into your contacts, and you can actually allow it to sync with your phone bill. And it takes your email, it takes your phone calls, and it takes all of your contact information on your phone and syncs it together to build a customer relationship manager. And it is also one of the cool things uh, about this software is it is proactive. So it will send you an update to say, hey, customer XYZ, you were emailing them six months ago. You typically email them every three months. You haven't talked to them in five months. So you should probably send them a follow-up email just to touch base uh, with them. So this is more... Um, it uses an algorithm to find out who is important to you and tries to remember things when you don't. And you don't have to do data entry with this particular program, which is one of the things that I really like uh, about close.com, is it literally um, can read the email, read your phone bill, put all of that information together. It will suggest new contacts for you, um, and it just kind of makes life easier. So all of these uh, softwares start with free versions and of course you know they're running a business too so there is uh, upgrade fees and uh, you can see which model really works for you there all right so those are just some recommendations uh, I want to open it up we're getting really close to the end of our time here just want to open it up for a few minutes uh, if anybody has any questions that we can answer you can do that now Karen any questions coming in all right Okay, so no questions this morning. So I think we covered a lot of information. This broadcast will actually be live uh, up on the website probably no later than Monday. Um, so you can, if you missed anything or if you want to go back and rewrite the questions down, you can go back on Monday at stallstv.com. In the meantime, if you have some time this weekend, I invite you to visit the Stalls TV forum. So visit stallstv.com, click on the forums tab, and you can start a conversation there if you have additional questions. Really appreciate you tuning in today. I'm Zach Ellsworth, and that's it for this Stalls TV presentation.